this, uh, Senator Thatcher, who's going to talk to us uh, about relativity as pure chronometry. Thanks, Thank Tim. We've been focusing a lot on the metaphysical implications of theories that are going to come from quantum gravity. What I'd like to do is to explore a sense in which we may already have some similar sorts of conclusions even before we start to know anything about quantum. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about whether space is already not fundamental, uh, emergent, derived, ontologically dependent. Maybe we can have a discussion about the relevant sense in which it is not fundamental, but in some sense not fundamental already uh, before we get to quantum gravity. Now, we're already familiar with the relativity of simultaneity in relativity theory, where slices of space are relative to a particular trajectory or world line of some observer. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about the relativity here. But here I mean to investigate rather the non-fundamentality of the spatial concepts themselves. This talk is a bit of a different flavor because it's kind of got a history and philosophy of science element to it. The reason for that is that this idea that somehow spatial concepts themselves can be non-fundamental or derived is something that I, I first learned about when I was reading a bit about the history of the golden age of general relativity between 1955 and 1975. The, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the context leading up to that period. And then I'm going to describe to you a proposal for this non-fundamentality of spatial concepts from John Lytton Singh. Now, Singh never really went through in complete detail to make this proposal successful. I'm going to tell you some reasons why I think that's the case. But I thought, maybe I can do one better. So that's what I'm going to try to do in the last section, is I'm going to try to explain how we can go through with Singh's proposal. And I'll also explain the question mark at the very end. Maybe not every single thing that Singh hoped could be done can be done with the type of proposal that he made. Uh, and that's what that uh, would all discuss at the very end. OK, so let's start with the context leading up to Singh's idea. Uh, this is a quotation from a lecture from uh, Albert Einstein uh, about geometry and experience. But let's read it together. It's clear that the solid body and the clock do not, in the conceptual edifice of physics, play the part of irreducible elements, but that of composite structures, which must not play any independent part in theoretical physics. But it is my conviction that in the present stage of development, and here he's speaking in 1921, of theoretical physics, these concepts must still be employed as independent concepts. For we're still far from possessing such certain knowledge of the theoretical principles of atomic structure as to be able to construct solid bodies and clocks theoretically from elementary concepts. What, what Einstein is referring to here is a, a common framework and assumption that people around this period took to try to understand how spatial and temporal concepts are represented in physical theories, which is that they had to correlate them to ways of measuring them. This is related to the philosophical ideas about verificationist concepts of meaning, that the, con that the very meaning of spatial and temporal concepts is either given by or directly related to the means of verification of them. So here is a very nice summary by uh, one of my favorite papers in history of relativity theory by Marco Giovanelli uh, that he wrote about nine years ago uh, on this issue. Uh, Marco summarizes the, the situation in this way. In order to make relativity theory physically meaningful, we have to assume the actual is existence in nature of physical processes permitted by some physical laws, which can be used to define and reproduce the units of length and time at Do different space-time points. Sorry? Do you agree with this? <clears throat> uh, <laughs> I, I don't, but I'll get to that in a few slides. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What Marco is doing here, though, to be clear, uh, is he's explaining the situation as the community found itself in during this time period. Um, 
Now, he then goes on to add his own claim where he's endorsing this kind of picture. Um, and I think that Marco's description or endorsement gives a, gives a good urgency to what these folks saw the problem was. Here's what Marco says. He says, I would dare to claim that the fate of special and general relativity as physical theories, and not only as the mathematical manipulation of quantities, depends entirely on the validity of such a principle and should thus be considered one of the central issues, if not the central issue, in the epistemology of relativistic geometry. What is the principle? A principle that tells you how it is that rods and clocks are the kinds of things that really are reading out the spatial and temporal concepts. So there's this question, how do we represent sp spatial and temporal concepts within the theory? How are they correlated with the means of their verification? And in this context, this was the central epistemological problem that Einstein didn't know how to get around because he recognized that, uh, okay, like this is a rod, okay, ish, yeah, a rod. Uh, this is a material object. As a material object, it's described by its own equations of motion because it's, descri it's composed of real material stuff that behaves the sorts of equations of motion that material stuff does. And similarly, uh, clocks, like uh, the one that is in my cell phone here, right? This is a clock of a sort. It also has periodic changes or other sorts of regularities that correlate the structure of the physical thing to time. These are things that should not be postulated. They should be derived in the theory. But Einstein didn't see any way in this operationalist, verificationist milieu to try to bring everything together in a coherent way. He had to allow himself the postulation of, of rods and clocks. Okay. That's the situation in which things kind of still found themselves by the end of World War II. In the late 1940s and the 1950s, new generation of researchers started to look at relativity theory with new eyes, uh, and it, not just new eyes because they were different people, but new eyes that had seen new developments in mathematics that grew up and were trained in different sorts of traditions of formalisms that they then brought to bear upon uh, this problem. So let's turn to John Lytton Singh. Uh, Singh was an Irish mathematical physicist who made his career in Ireland, the UK, and uh, Canada. This particular quotation is from um, a, a bibliography, a summary bibli bibliography of Singh uh, in a collection of papers in his honor. Uh, here's what it reads. It says, it's a remarkable fact that hardly a single space-time diagram is to be found in the standard text on relativity before Singh's own presentation in 1956. To many, the 1956 book came as a revelation. Here was a royal road to relativity, which did not involve precarious juggling with factors of gamma. The pervasive influence of this book can be traced in much of the re best research of the last 15 years, this being written in 1971, with its new emphasis on invariant geometrical characterization. So Sang brought these new invariant geometrical ideas to this epistemological context, this problem of trying to understand how we can uh, coordinate rods and clocks with their spatial and temporal concepts in relativity theory. Now, Sang's main two books, there's one on the special theory and one on the general theory. These, as you can see from the dates of publication, 1956 and 1960 are happening at the very beginning of this golden age. This is the reason why they were able to be so influential, is that these introducing these new geometrical ways of understanding the theory that introduce, as we'll see, uh, the types of space-time diagrams that are now so familiar to us that it's hard for us to see that at one point they were entirely novel. But Singh wasn't just an academic. He also wrote for our popular audiences. Here's a paper, a very short paper that I recommend to you. Uh, you could read it probably in 10 minutes. It's like three or four pages. 
uh, in New Scientist from 1959. It's called A Plea for Chronometry. Uh, let's read the, uh, the abstract together. The author, Tseng, contends that measurement of time is the most basic measurement in physics. We've been misled by Euclid into putting space first. He proposes that the name chronometry be applied to that part of science which deals with the concept of time. Let's take a look at what Singh says in this, because it's here where he starts to apply these new tools to understanding the predicament of uh, spatial and temporal concepts. Singh wants to emphasize that there's two senses in which he wants to, in his conception of relativity theory, take temporal concepts as basic. The first is practical. Okay, let's look at his exposition for the practical uh, basicness or fundamentality of temporal concepts over spatial concepts. So he writes that my, Singh's, view is that of all measurements made in physics, the measurement of time is the most basic. And the theory underlying those measurements is the most basic theory of all. Chronometry is the true basis of physics. We should start with time, not space. The rigid bodies one thinks about in geometry do not exist in nature with a precision comparable to the precision of an atomic clock. So this practical conception of basic, Sang has in mind, involves um, really uh, meteorological ideas. His idea is what sorts of physical concepts can we measure the most precisely? And he's observing that we can measure temporal concepts more precisely. And if you have any idea about an ordering or a relative fundamentality relation that you want to postulate in, uh, in your theory about how these concepts are related, it's a good idea uh, purely for practical or precision-based reasons to start with time. Uh, here's a wonderful diagram that he gives to illustrate this idea in this um, uh, New Scientist paper. In the first figure, we have an example of someone trying to measure the distance to the moon using a rod. Uh, can, can you see? What they're, so they're holding up the rod and they're trying to get it aligned with the moon here. They're like, have we touched the moon? And it has to be really, really rigid, right? Because otherwise it's going to be wobbling all around. You're going to hit the moon and then, uh, it's really impractical. But remember, right, there was this idea that we had to understand spatial concepts as somehow being given by the quantities that rigid rods would measure out. In astronomy, can you, anyone seriously believe that, he says? <laughs> Here's what we actually do when we measure the distance, right? We bounce a radar signal from Earth off of either the surface of the moon or a carefully placed uh, mirror that we place there that's reflective uh, to the relevant wavelengths of light. It comes back, we detect it, we measure how long it takes, and then we perform a calculation. We determine a distance from this world line to this world line by taking into account the fact that we have a fixed speed of light and the duration that we measure here, we can then recalculate what the, um, what the distance is. His suggestion is that we should understand spatial concepts as being derivative on temporal concepts in this way. Spatial concepts are derivative on temporal concepts in the sense that they combine measurements of duration of processes <coughs> with bouncing of signals that, tra that, are, that traverse null geodesics. It could be a light ray, it could be something else which is well approximated in that way. Uh, but in practice, it's often something like radar. Now, Singh also had a second sense in which, it, uh, in which it's basic, right? Uh, and it's one that I was just alluding to a second ago, not just for practical reasons, but he also wants to take uh, temporal concepts is conceptually more basic, more fundamental than spatial concepts. Here's what he says uh, when he's explaining this. There's been a good deal of confusion in relativity theory, he says, concerning the physical meaning of the uh, infinitesimal line element <coughs> defined in the metric. It seems uh, to have been thought that this quantity, when you integrate it up, uh, has two physical interpretations, 
uh, of entirely different kinds according to whether it's positive or negative. You'll remember that the Lorentz metric, it's got some negatives, it's got some positives, and you choose a convention, right? One of them is going to be representing space-like directions, the other is going to be uh, time-like directions. This is what he's referring to. And he's picking a particular convention where the negative quantities are the uh, temporal ones. So that's what he means when if phi is negative, we have the chronometric interpretation. But if phi is positive, it has been customary to regard it as a measure of length. What he's referring to here is the fact that we have two representational postulates, traditionally. One for durations and one for lengths. And in the verificationist context that we were, that, um, that happened some decades ago from which, to which he's responding, those separate concepts have to be correlated with different types of measurement apparatuses, um, clocks and rods. But he's saying here that he's not going to do that. In his book, he says that for us, time is the only basic measure and length or distance, insofar as it is even necessary or desirable to introduce it, is strictly a derived concept. And it'll be dealt with later in that spirit. Let's see how he does that. One of the things that he does, and here, I think that Singh is not completely rejecting the verificationist context uh, to which he res is responding. He postulates the existence of what he calls standard clocks. Uh, here's what he says about them. Any monotonic parameter increasing from the past into the future might be used to measure time on the world line of a material particle. We make this concept of time more concrete by assuming the existence of standard clocks, which may be carried by material particles and the ticking of which provides a measure of proper time. I have a diagram here of uh, a kind of cartoon of an atomic clock because Singh himself explicitly mentions atomic clocks as the best version of the kinds of uh, standard clocks that we can construct. So you can already see here, maybe he's, okay, this is, I'm editorializing a little bit now in my, my own view. He's maybe already conceding a little bit to the verificationist uh, too much. I mean, do, do you know personally any atoms that carry around such a machine with them? <laughs> I've never met one, but if you know one, please introduce me. I'd be interested in hearing uh, about how they do it. Okay. At least Carlo thought that was funny. Um, <laughs> so, but he also introduces a second assumption. And he has to introduce this second assumption because of this thing that he's conceding to the verificationist. It's what he calls a hypothesis of consistency. Here, I, I have a de direct uh, screenshot from, from his book. Let, let's look at it together uh, with the diagram. It's necessary to expose a certain physical assumption inherent in the structure of relativity. Let's consider the world line of a material particle here. Uh, and two events on it, A and B, you can see them labeled here. Uh, with B before A. So we're assuming some orientation uh, in time. The particle, we assume, can can carries with it two standard clocks. So on its left hand, I guess uh, it has one atomic clock with cesium, another it has another atomic clock with a uh, magnesium fountain or something. So it's got two of these, two of these clocks. Uh, consisting of atoms of different types, so for instance. Um, each clock registers a definite number of ticks between B and A. And you can see by the hashed lines the different number of ticks uh, that are going on here. On the one side with one clock, you've got N1 ticks. And then the other side, you've got N2 ticks. The, the ticks are representing, as it were, or at least so we would like to have different units of time. Now, the physical assumption here is that these two have to be consistent with one another, that the ratio of n1 to n2 is a natural constant. And it's independent of the world line on which the observations have made uh, and the events on that world line. So he's supposing that whenever you have any two standard clocks, even if their units of ticking are different, that the, uh, uh, the ratio of their rates of ticking is, uh, is, a, is a constant. So with these two assumptions, he proposes to uh, describe how to derive spatial concepts from temporal concepts. 
Uh, this is a page where most of that uh, most of that happens. I'm a little unsatisfied with this, but let me go through with uh, his description, and then I'll tell you why I'm unsatisfied with it. So uh, Singh asks us to imagine uh, a space-like uh, link between A and B, whose magnitude we want to derive roughly using the sort of radar ranging method that we were discussing before. But he assumes that this space-like curve is in fact not a curve in space-time at all, but it's an infinitesimal uh, curve. It, it is a kind of a space-like vector. Or if you'd like, this is a geodesic in Minkowski space-time rather than in a general space-time. And then he imagines that you have some, in this case, another infinitesimal line, or you could think of it again as a geodesic in Minkowski space-time, CD that's passing through um, uh, the, the point A, such that CB is null and BD is null. Then he does a calculation, right? Uh, the space-time metric is going to determine the magnitudes of uh, CA and AD. And according to his construction, right, you can prove that the square of this quantity here, AB, uh, is the product of CA and AD. So if you have two times, one duration from CA, excuse me, from C to A and another from A to D, that you can, in a certain sense, define, according to saying, the length. What it means for something to be a length is just, in this particular construction, a quantity that is the square root of the product of these two. OK. So that's all he says about it. I'm not totally satisfied that this is really recapturing spatial concepts, that we're deriving spatial concepts from temporal concepts here. There's a couple of reasons for this. One is that he's assuming that there's uh, in order, right, on, our, on, these, on these curves that is given by the metric, uh, and the magnitude is given by some standard clocks whose existence and consistency are, are assumed. This is just the same problem that Einstein was describing how he couldn't overcome, right? If you assume a standard clock, it bears to reason that what we mean when we talk about a clock is an object that to some extent or other, to some degree of approximation or other, in some circumstances, measures time. Right? The issue is that if we can't then use that, definition, that as a definition of time, because we need to know what time is, at least to some extent, in order to determine what a good clock is. There seems to be rather conceptually an interplay between our concepts of time and how we represent them, and the sorts of material objects that we use to try to measure that, uh, that, that type of quantity. In other words, right, the same criticism that Einstein recognized was a defect in his own foundation in this verificationist context is that these chronometric assumptions should be consequences of our matter theory. They shouldn't be assumptions that are put in. So that's a kind of unsatisfactory feature of his derivation. Another has to do with some details about this hypothesis of consistency. So here's the issue. Uh, Time-like world lines can have take on any real magnitude. P pick, pick your favorite units. It'll take, you, you'll find time-like curves that take on real magnitudes of any, um, uh, any, any which you desire, as long as the space-time is uh, complete. Now, because of that, that means that if you have any two clocks that are ticking, right, it's not necessarily going to be the case that the duration along that curve is an integer multiple of either of the ticking amounts. So because of this, the ratio between n1 and n2 is not always going to be constant. Just add a little bit of uh, addition here so that you get one tick on one side but not another tick on the other side. There's some play with uh, the, uh, the ratio. I, I think that everyone understands kind of what Singh was getting at, but the particular execution here, I think, uh, doesn't quite hit the mark. Of course, one only needs this hypothesis of consistency if one is uh, accepting the idea that one has to introduce temporal concepts by means of introducing standard clocks. 
why not just not do that? Like, why not just help yourself to temporal concepts and assume that we allow ourselves to represent them in theory directly? If we do that, we get around both of these problems, I think. I'm going to explain a little bit more about how I would prefer to do that in a bit. The second criticism with Singh's approach is that this is, I mean, he's talking about this all in the context of infinitesimal geometry. So this is all happening either in the tangent space at a point, or it's happening uh, in some region of Minkowski space-time. But we want this derivation to be completely general. We don't want this just to be an account of how we can reduce spatial concepts, say, to temporal concepts in special relativity, but also how we can do it in general relativity. OK. Uh, at best, this is only going to apply uh, approximately to curves in general relativity. Yeah. <clears throat> so so uh, this is all in the context of the uh, uh, reference frame of the, of the person around, right? So we're not looking at any other reference frame. We're looking at all these measurements being made in the, in the frame of reference of the observer. There's no frame of references that are being introduced. Uh, but I mean, the measurement is being done by you know, tick, the, the, the ticking of the clock. Um, it's in the, along the world line of some particular world line, right? So proper time. So it looks like you're measuring. It's a way of measuring the proper time of call it the observer or whatever. It, it is, but the idea is that um, proper time is well defined without reference to any to any reference frame. That's the idea. Right, right, right. Okay. Maybe, maybe, so maybe if we, it's if, in yeah. The world, it's in, okay, right. it's yeah. The frame of the, because the reference frame is defined by those projectors. Yeah. No yeah. way around. One of the things that that Singh really wanted to emphasize, and that I tried to introduce a little bit um, in my introducing some of the historical context is that Singh, as much as possible, wanted to draw these diagrams without presupposing that this is a particular coordinatization of the, of the phenomena. Uh, because in, in giving a geometrical perspective, he wanted to get away from the idea that all of the content of relativity theory is expressed in this mass of algebraic Ooh. equations. Um, yeah. Uh, another feature, I think, which is a bit of a, uh, uh, a defect when it comes to elegance in the construction of the procedures, the arbitrariness of the curve CAD. Um, there's a sense in which if you, there's lots of different curves that you could pick, and they're all going to give the same answer if you do the construction in the right way. But there's something unsatisfactory about the fact that you have a range of options, and you have to kind of like pick one about how to define this. Uh, particular uh, quantity uh, when any of them will do. AD is a geodesic annotation. Uh, CAD? CAD is a geodesic. So if this is a Minkowski space time, it will be, yeah. With a straight line. That's right, that's right. It, but you could pick other straight lines like these. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Let's go to how we might resolve these problems. So, my goal here is. Let's suppose that we want, to, we want to go with Singh, and we want to go as far as we can to accomplish this project. Can we do a little bit better? Uh, I, I think we can. I already mentioned this particular move that gets rid of some of the problems. Um, introduce the representation of time and help yourself to the representation of time in the theory. Um, just assume that the space-time metric represents durations. Uh, expressed in some unit or other, of course. But it's given by the familiar formula. There's no new physics here. This is everything that you are already familiar with. We assign uh, a magnitude to a time-like curve based on this particular integral. This is just integrating the duration that, uh, uh, that, the, that the curve uh, represents. And this doesn't presuppose the existence of standard clocks. Maybe the universe that we're interested in modeling here Things are so chaotic, there's no regular phenomena. But still, we want to assign a duration, because we want to say how long the chaos lasts in this universe, for instance. 
And so therefore, because it doesn't assume any standard clocks, there's no need to assume any hypothesis of consistency either. OK. Um, one thing that I do want to mention is this does assume that there is one concept of duration. Uh, when I've discussed similar material in other, in other contexts, uh, people are interested in discussing how substantive of an assumption this is. Um, I might say that for discussion. If no one's interested, then we can just leave it aside. But I'm, I would be interested in talking about that if you are. Finally, let's talk about the last sort of step, the extension outside of the infinitesimal domain. OK, so uh, here I've got a sketch of a kind of construction. This type of construction, I think, for those who have thought about relativity theory, will not be surprising to you. Uh, in fact, if it's unsurprising, then I think I've done my job. Here's the idea. Suppose that you have some space-like curve. It doesn't necessarily need to be a GD stick that's represented, that's in uh, some relativistic space-time. It's given by this blue curve here that I tried to draw in a nice way in my uh, paint program, but I didn't succeed. You see the blue curve? OK. So now what we're going to do is we're going to assume that this curve is uh, compact. In other words, it's got a starting point and an ending point. Uh, so that when you map a, a, a chunk, an interval of the real line into it, it's got a definite starting point and a definite ending point, like 0 and 1, or pi and 16 pi, or something like that. OK. Now what we're going to do is we're going to partition the image of this curve into chunks. Uh, pick your favorite partition. It, it doesn't really matter. We're going to start with one partition, and then we're going to refine it later on. So pick some partition. That is to say, we're just dividing up the space-like uh, line into sequential chunks. So like here's a chunk, and here's a chunk, and the line would go all further on. There would be may maybe uh, many other chunks, but a finite number of chunks because the curve is compact. OK, now let's project normal time like GUD6 at the uh, junctures of the chunks. You see here, C is one of these. C prime is another one of these. What these are representing is these are representing, say, for instance, uh, free-falling uh, radar satellites. right? And these radar satellites, they have the ability to bounce radar off of events, stuff in the space-time. Not moving in the frame of the blue line. Sorry? Not moving in the frame of the blue line. Yeah, I haven't assumed that there's any particular frame that's associated with the blue line. But you're right that if each of these, each of these satellites, if they were to carry an orthonormal frame with them, then uh, according to the... To in, in, in a point of the blue line, there are different satellites that pass by there, or kind of, but you want to choose the particular one that, in the, in, 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 that is normal. So in, it's not moving if I'm sitting with the frame of the blue line, you say. So zero velocity with respect to the frame of the blue line, is that right? Yes, that's right. That's right. Now, the blue line may do its own wiggly thing. It may do its own wiggly thing. Um, but these curves passing through, right? we can imagine each of these satellites shooting off a radar signal. And when are we going to decide to shoot off the radar signal? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the size of the chunks of the curve. So suppose that the size of the chunk of the curve is 1 or 2 or 3 or something as determined by the metric. And we're going to fire off our radar signal uh, at uh, an event Q1, which is that uh, number of uh, uh, units before n. And then we will de detect it um, uh, at, at Q2. Now. You'll see that what will happen in general is that the points uh, that we're going to assume that, get, uh, that uh, the radar signal bounces off of are not going to lie on the blue curve in general, unless the blue curve is, in fact, a space like geodesic. In that case, it will. Um, but what will happen is the following ph uh, phenomenon. You can do a calculation that's similar to the calculation that Singh did, and you can sum up all of these temporal magnitudes, these durations. So you're summing up a bunch of times, basically. And you can show that this quantity will approximate 
uh, or at least half of that sum actually, will, because we've got one here and one here, one here and one here, that quantity will approximate the magnitude of the blue curve as given by the metric. And moreover, the approximation will be better and better as you refine the partition. So as these get smaller and smaller and smaller, the approximation will be better and better and better, and the convergence is, in fact, uniform. Uh, how do you know q1 before knowing the, the length and choose what you measure? Ah, so um, this is not intended as an operational uh, definition of it's supposed to show how, well, actually, maybe I say this here. Length is just the quantification of the time needed to pr probe elsewhere with the radar. So this is not a guide to determining the lengths of particular things that you don't know, but it's rather supposed to be a way in which length concepts can be derived from temporal concepts. Um, in particular, length concepts are quantifications of durations in this sort of process. How do you choose Q1? Uh, Q1 is, is before the intersection, an amount given by the length of the curve. So mm -hmm. you, give, you, you have to know the length of the curve to do this construction. Right? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the goal here is not to somehow Define, the, define some chunk of the metric as it's being applied and integrated over here. Uh, it's rather to show how the, the magnitude that, the cur that, that, that that quantity represents can be understood in terms of this physically interpreted duration. That's, that's the goal. That's the goal. So it's not inten this construction is not intended to derive certain structures of relativity theory from other structures, but it's rather to show how spatial concepts uh, don't require their own principle of representation. That you can show that what, if you take what all the durations are as a way of quantifying uh, the time needed to probe elsewhere with radar, then you can dispense with a separate representational principle for lengths. You can, in other words, spare the rod. Okay, okay so maybe this doesn't completely uh, accomplish what uh, Singh sought to accomplish. Here are the two kinds of concerns. I don't know how big they are. We can discuss. It's not an entirely pure notion of chronometry in Singh's sense. The reason for this is that in order to do this construction, we still need the concepts of four neighborhoods uh, of points, and we need, still need a kind of qualitative space, spatial relation, a kind of elsewhere relation, right? even if we don't consider it to be uh, a new um, type of temporal, a new type of unit or, or, uh, or magnitude. We still need to have the idea that there are, po there are events related to O uh, that are not connected by any duration, any process with a, with a duration. We have to accept a kind of qualitative, some, some people would say um, topological or um, or, uh, or something like that, notion of an elsewhere um, uh, in order to make this work. And you might think that for that reason it's not a pure chronometry, that there's some kind of pared down spatial concept that is assumed here. I think that's right. I think though that still this is, this, this is of interest, even if it's not pure chronometry in the sense that Singh imagined that we could have. This is a more technical thing, so it, it is really required in the construction that the, cur that the spatial curve be compact. Uh, otherwise, the convergence conditions are not necessarily satisfied. The reason why I don't consider this to be a big problem is that if you, if you have a, a non-compact curve, you can divide it up into infinitely many different compact segments, and then you can perform this construction on each of those segments. Uh, so if you allow yourself to have a second limiting process uh, instead of just one limiting process, then this can be overcome as well. Uh, and and that, that's it, actually. So thanks for your kind attention. <laughs>
Okay, thank you very much indeed. Very interesting talk, getting us back to the golden age. We'll see how far we are from the golden age in a minute. Um, I thought it would be useful to start with a visual summary of Sam's talk. So we first need a basic ontology. It's the ontology of person, Singh and Sam Fletcher. And there's some interaction between these basic building blocks so, and con conversation going on. Basically, the idea we are talking about is, I'm, I'm phrasing it very carefully, we can talk about this later, is that you can measure length using um, clocks, which sounds a bit strange. And then um, Sam raised a couple of objections um, or questions. So one question is about the orientation and time, what is already assumed, and he, had, he has a kind of answer to that question, right? And again, there's the issue about consistency. For him, this is part of the first issue, but I have separated them. And um, it, it, it turns out that consistency isn't an issue if we take this kind of solution here. And then there's a third problem, and again, he has a kind of answer. So we have learned from Barry Lehrer that we need laws. So I think there are two laws here. I mean, the first law is be interesting. The one is be nice. So I mean, Sam is sort of interesting. He raises interesting points. But then he's sort of nice and says, yeah, I have a solution. I can help you. OK, so this is kind of graphical summary. This is something like special signs, but it's not getting deep enough here. For instance, this law here is very spurious. I mean, what do we mean here? So we have to think a little bit more about the rules of the game. And I think the historical context he pointed that out is the axiomatization of general relativity. Now, this is something that a lot of people don't care anymore. I mean, we, a lot of people don't think that uh, theories are axioms or set of axioms and so on. And they don't much bother how the axioms are formulated. But I think this is the background for seeing. Another is a very um, interesting um, distinction between two kinds of axiomizations. And I take this from Reichenbach and Martin Kaye. I'll show you the paper in a second. So there's first constructive axiomization, and then there's deductive axiomization. I take this from this paper. Here, this is a paper from um, Martin Kaye from 1990. It's quite old. And he goes back to Reichenbach. So what is the idea of constructive um, axiomatization? I, I think I can rephrase it better than Kaye. The aim here is, and these are just different formulations of the same aim, to establish the magical structure of space-time on the basis of simple experiences, or to establish the evidential ground of GTR without making use of one's conceptual apparatus, or determining the actually realized metric without relying on Einstein's field equations. I'm not sure whether all this is exactly the same, but I mean, this is the direction we're moving when we are interested in um, constructive axiomatization. And deductive axiomatization is just no such constraint. I mean, you, you take your axioms and then you derive something, you get your metaphysics. I think this is what a lot of people are doing in naturalized metaphysics. I mean, you, you see the axioms and then you see, okay, the, the theory is talking about space, a wave function, and so on, and then you try to find out what is kind of only descriptive fluff in uh, John Ehrman's words and what is the real ontology here. But I think when we're talking about Singh, then, then we have to be careful because I think he's sort of interested in this kind of constructive optimization. Now, okay, he points out that there's a kind of um, problem here. Um, there's a tension because if you want to be constructive, then there is a danger that the theory is not complete. And completeness here is the demand that the theory can account for measurements. The idea is not that the uh, theory can give you a description of the whole world, but rather that, I mean, it can at least account for the measurements that we are um, making to determine whether the theory holds or not. Now, this is a kind of historical map. What, what happened? I, I guess the first axioms of relativity were non-constructive, or I mean, so you can think. I mean, in many textbooks, there's just basic axioms written down. Then you can say, OK, I, I want to be constructive, so I use, use uh, rods and clocks. Then you might want to say, that's a bit too much, and this is basically Sunger's point, um, only use rods. And this is how Sung is um, normally um, sort of um, seen in the history. So from a paper, I'm, I'm getting to this, excluding for well-known reason Richard Rudels as primitive physical concepts, we may follow Sing and accept them as basic, the concepts particle and standard clock. So that's kind of reduction going on here. But a lot of people think that this is not enough. Um, and that, I mean, in the end, 
we don't even need the clocks and this leads us to EPS. This is the proposal by Elas, Pirani and Schild, first published in 1972. So this is the idea, you have some sort of basis of the theory without clocks and you don't need any rods. So from this perspective, we are only talking about an intermediate stage here. And Niels has a nice paper on EPS, so um, he probably knows much better about that than me. So Carrier now is, is still um, sort of critical about um, EPS and thinks it, 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 think it, it doesn't really um, live up to its um, ambition, but that's not the main point. Let's now get to this kind of conversation and I'm finished, right? So, I mean, um, this was the first part of the conversation. Um, so the question is, yeah, how are we dealing with time? And from the perspective of constructive axiomization, I think um, Sam's reply wouldn't be sort of allowed, I guess. So if these are the rules of the game, then I mean, he should frankly say, no, that's not the answer. So we cannot assume time. We cannot just assume that we have a metric and we can sort of calculate, you saw the integral, right? Um, calculate that and so on. Um, rather, I mean, we have to explain what exactly are we talking about and then, I mean, you need these kind of constructions. Maybe not more things constructs, but something like that. So I think it very much depends on the rules. There's some relativity here. I mean, if, if you want to do metaphysics and are interested in sort of deductive axiomization, yeah, take the axioms, learn from it anything, fine. But if you are interested in this kind of historical program, then you have to be very careful about that. Now consistency, I mean, now the consistency problem pops up again, right? Because I mean, I'm saying we need something here at this point. Um, but I mean, I, basically you pointed out that the problem can be solved. I mean, it's a sloppy formulation on the part of a thing. It's exactly right what he's saying that, I mean, if there are two atomic clocks, then maybe one, I mean, doesn't finish with exactly one and one, but rather there's a little time over and one, right? But I mean, you can reformulate consistency and this is an attempt to do so. So basically for any kind of measurement, you can look at this interval and what you only need is that this interval um, sort of um, in overlap on one point. And that would be the true ratio of N1 and N2. So I think consistency, we, we, we have a solution for that. Um, now we come to this kind of infinitesimality. Um, this was the last complaint, the second large complaint or question or objection against thing on the part of Sam. I have to say I, agree with, I disagree with a couple of um, remarks that you did. I think that, that we're here relying on geodesics is not a problem because I mean we have an idea of freely falling particles or clocks and that can be operationalized so that's fine. Then you said that this doesn't work for all curves. I think this is a good comment. I agree with that. Then um, you said that there is a dependence on the curve. I mean, there are different kind of world lines. And I, I think that they get different distances because distance is not an invariant. But I mean, we know that distance is not an invariant. So yeah, I mean, that happens. Sorry about that. But I mean, there is no unrelative notion of a length or something like that. And of course, I mean, um, you, you, you um, need this kind of extension from the um, infinitesimal to the um, Finite, let's put it. Um, I'm not exactly sure about your construction, but I think it's in the right spirit. So I think that, that, that's a great addition. I have a little um, thing because I don't think it's always one half. There's one number, one half, but we can discuss that maybe privately because that's maybe too much of a detail. So that's the comment. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
the one or the other. If you read his book, he's really just trying to give, it's really a textbook. It's a textbook on general relativity. Um, and he's explicit that in order to understand general relativity, we can't just do some mathematics. We have to think carefully about the concepts. It's one of the things that I really love about Singh's book is that he really, for the time that he's writing, is bringing a totally different viewpoint uh, that to me was very inspiring and still is very inspiring. Now, that viewpoint uh, is not necessarily trying to accomplish the same sort of project that Eves Pirani and Shield are doing. Uh, and the reason for this is that um, uh, Singh himself, he helps himself to Lorentzian geometry from the very beginning. And he doesn't see any need to try to convince people that that's uh, what, uh, that that has to be constructed from some other sorts of elements. He does give some heuristic arguments for why this is a reasonable thing to do. But ultimately, he says, like, the, the viability of this approach will be in its applications, not in the particular arguments that are given for, like, why, this, why you pick this over that. I should say that um, my own view on the, this sort of distinction between these two ways of formulating the foundations of a theory I'm a little worried that the distinction, when it's examined in enough detail, can't really be upheld. Here's the reason for that. So if you look at what EPS are doing, um, they do have to assume certain representational concepts already from the beginning. <coughs> they have to assume, for example, that the structures that we're familiar with, world lines, right, represent in some sense or other histories of particles. Now, they don't assume from the very beginning necessarily that it has all the structure that we would have from a Lorentzian metric. But it seems that they need some of the stuff the deductive approach like, already uh, helps themselves to. So it seems to me that for, on these grounds, like uh, maybe the distinction between these two is, um, is not as clear. In that, for that reason, there might be another way of viewing what that distinction is supposed to be doing. Uh, and I have some thoughts on that, but I can leave that for further discussion only if people are interested in talking about it. Um, I would say maybe one thing that I'm a little worried about, about the solution for the consistency problem, is that if you allow yourself only this interval, it also allows for situations where, in fact, consistency doesn't hold, and there's this variability between clocks, uh, which is very slight. Um, I think what you would need to do is you would need to have a whole collection of clocks that have such a variety of different intervals and then assume this hypothesis of consistency for clocks of arbitrary inter interval length. I think that would do, that would do, the, the, do the trick. Um, and there's a certain sense, actually, in which EPS have to assume this. Uh, so in their construction, uh, apologies for people who haven't studied this particular episode, they have to, in the construction that they give, the, deriva the structure that they get out isn't fully um, Lorentzian geometry. It's something called vial geometry. A vial geometry is like Lorentzian geometry, except there's no guarantee that two processes, which start off on the same world line and then depart and then come back together, will, after coming back together, be experiencing time at the same rates. Now, we're used to the idea that, the different, that there's going to be a different elapse of time. Uh, from when they come back together. That's just the twin phenomena, or I, I don't want to say paradox because there's no paradox. The twin phenomena that we're, we're used to. But we're not used to the idea that when they come back together, they're, they're, after they're together and they're both at rest with respect to one another, their clocks are ticking at different rates. And that's a possibility in vial geometry. And that's exactly the possibility that is being ruled out by this hypothesis of consistency. And that's exactly the assumption <laughs> that uh, EPS have to assume in order to complete their construction. And the way that they do that is roughly speaking along the lines that I was, I was describing. Uh, from my point of view, because they already have to help themselves to some of the uh, deductive axiomatization style approach uh, in the first place to describe world lines as history of particles, for instance, why not just go all the way? Well, thank you very much. We have about 25 minutes for comments and questions. Um, I would kindly invite everybody to keep their comments and questions as concise as possible so that everybody gets a chance to uh, 
uh, to raise their points. Um, Carlo, let me go first. So thanks Sam, very much. This was very, very nice lighting, and thanks also for uh, putting in light Singer influences. I didn't know anything about that. Yeah. Um, very bad situation since I'm working with this black white transition whose yeah. first idea is by Singer. Oh, interesting. This is a paper recipe. So my comment is very technical. Oh. So if you want to drop it, I'm fine. We can continue. Uh, can, can you do this slide with your view? main geometrical construction. Let's see if I can do it. So let me start from the end. I believe if, uh, first let me make a technical definition that I, 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 I tell you why I think it's like that. It's that point P, in, instead of putting where you have put it, where you have decided to put it, you put it on the point N prime one. Yep. Okay. And so for all the others. Yep. Okay. I am ready to bet <laughs> that uh, what you uh, come out with at the end is exactly the same thing as in the beginning. Yeah, I agree with you. So this is like a tangent construction. You're describing a kind of secant construction. Yeah. In the limit, they're going to be the same. Yeah. And I would claim that if you do it this way, mm. it becomes more interesting mm. and stronger your point. Mm. Because you would avoid the problem of choosing Q in terms of the physical length n1, n2. So you don't have to know the length for doing the construction. You just have to choose a q such it gets to the next dot and, and bounce it back. I see. And everything would work exactly, but much more cleanly. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that, Carlo, because I had thought, like, do I do the tangent construction or do I do the secant construction? The reason that I picked the tangent construction is that it connects each of the previous ones. Yeah. It does, but I want to be able to interpret each of these particular each of these particular parts. And the radar ranging interpretation is just so attractive. Um, well the thing that Yeah, I guess so what I would need to do is I would need to have the idea that um, the yeah, yeah, that's that's the thing is that I, I would have to give an I would have to give an explanation for like well why why yeah yeah exactly um, yeah yeah it, it, like the the convergence will happen in exactly the same way so that's I think maybe what I should do when I write this up is to say here's one option here's another option they have slightly different flavors you pick the flavor you like and we're all happy cool uh, yeah. Wondering about how this sort of uh, construction you've got here and the conceptual point that you seem to be making might connect to these ideas about fundamentality. Yeah. So is the thought that because you can sort of construct something that looks like length out of time, that this suggests that there's sort of conceptual dependence between these two things, and then from there, therefore, there's some metaphysical dependence. And so I guess it's that second step that I'm just going to go. It's not obvious to me how you get from the conceptual claim to the metaphysical claim. I was just wondering if you could maybe draw me a line. Yeah. Uh, there's many different lines. And the reason why there's many different lines is it depends on exactly the notion of dependence that one wants to have. And I've, I've left that open. Um, I think that I need a more metaphysical collaborator to help me figure out what the right notion is. Mm. Um, yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. I love that. In fact, I might be able to change one of these diagrams such that when the there's a squared quantity that appears later, I might be able to change the variable so that it it's, it writes S A M, and so then we would actually be able to do that. So here here's the idea. Um, you can think of it an analogy with um, a very basic. Uh, notion of uh, energy that you find in classical mechanics. So think about like the you define you quantify the work done on an object, right, as the force exerted on the object over a distance, right, and then you quantify that as a change in energy. That sort of energy you can understand as being reducible to to force in, in distance um, in that particular context. Of course, energy is a a, a big concept. But I wanted to illustrate that particular sort of idea as what's going on here, is that we're constructing one 
um, a type of unit from, from another uh, via a particular type of generic construction. And that's what's going on here, is that we are showing how uh, we can construct the concept, uh, the quantitative concept of length by showing that length just quantifies the time needed to probe things with radar in the same way that energy is just quantifying uh, the force done over, over, over distances uh, on a particular object. Yeah. Um, okay. Now, whatever, whatever type of metaphysical dependence that is, if it is a type of medical physical dependence, I'm going to need some. I'm going to need some help. Mm -hmm. So maybe you have an idea. I mean, I guess I was thinking. I haven't got quite that far yet. So I was thinking the conceptual dependence might just underdetermine the metaphysics, and so there might just be an extra step be. that sort of gets you from thinking that there's conceptual dependence. And I just what would be nice is a sort of another case from somewhere else in philosophy where it looks like the conceptual dependence does hold some kind of metaphysical dependence. That yep. could be OK, cool. So what if you have like a direct photo from that very point? Sort of, yeah. OK, thank you. I, I, I think, I mean, um, th th a couple of questions could be um, um, discussed here. And I think the step, I mean, from this kind of conceptual to the metaphysical is a very interesting one. I mean, you're interested in the metaphysics, right, and more concepts. But everything you showed us, um, Sam, this historical one was related to concept formation, you were but, but now one question is, I mean, how contingent is that? Because he's saying, look, I mean, great task, but we've lost uh, the problem. But maybe they, we might live in a generalistic world where we have great rods, but no clocks. We never have so, great rods. Yeah. yeah but, but because I mean, we don't have any rigidity. Yeah, but, but th one question would be, I mean, could we reverse the construction? Because, I mean, we have shown that it works one way, but maybe it works the other way around, too. I had thought about this, but the thing is that, um, I mean, there's an, there's an asymmetry in the metric signature which I think secretly and deeply creates an asymmetry in which of these types of physical concepts is more basic. I don't yet have a good way to express that, except by pointing to the thing that I was complaining about a second ago, that um, if you want to measure, like wh what is the type of thing that is, that is, measuring, that is measuring the lengths, right? Um, 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 what can I say? Uh, well, if you go the direction that I was going in and you disavow the need to describe these in terms of in operational terms because you think verificationism is a dead program, I don't have to worry about that anymore. Let's help ourselves to the theoretical concepts that we need and go from there. Um, could you... Maybe, but I have an intuition that is strong, but that's not an argument. I, I agree. I need to think about that more, Klaus. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Neil, I think you were. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, thank you. Very interesting. Very interesting. A um, quick question on um, your dismissal of the constructive deductive um, distinction. This is really meant in the context of TPS originally conceived as opposed to, um, um, say, after the principle or more generally, right? So if I had some extension of EPS as, I don't know, by Perlick or so, which might get around the second law criterion, would you be more charitable towards using this distinction? Or no, because the, the objection is not that they have to assume that there's no second clock effect. Right, okay. The objection is that the, the basic constructive elements that they assume secretly employ temporal and spatial concepts already. Uh, and so if you're already helping yourselves to those, why not just start with those from the fr in the first place? Right. I, I have a different reading about what is valuable uh -huh. in that sort of approach. I alluded to that. Maybe I, this is a good chance for me to say it. So whenever you have a physical theory that is highly mathematized and you want to show, you, may, you can make some postulates for saying, like, this quantity in the theory represents this type of physical magnitude or this type of physical thing. In principle, you could do it in a crazy way. Right. So here's a crazy uh, option. I take my Lorentzian manifold. I find any time-like curve. Here's my representational principle. That represents a duration of zero. 
all curves represent duration of zero. The theory has no time. That is silly. Why is it silly? The reason why it's silly is that when we start to then apply that theory to the target phenomena, we realize that it's entirely inadequate to represent the target phenomena. So I think that there's so a question arises with our standard representational principles. How do we know that those are not systematically misleading us in the way like that silly like zero uh, time, uh, zero duration uh, uh, thing is? I take constructions like EPS to be showing us, giving us some reassurance that um, uh, these things fit together in the way that we, that we expect. I, I see my own work on light clocks to be in that way uh, as well, to show that there's a coherence between the representational postulates of our theory and what we're intending to represent with the theory. Yeah. So there's a list of these things, you know, that, that there's just no analog. Exactly. Anything like this for the Emanian geometry, you, you, know, you need all curves. You know, there's sort of democracy of curves in, in every Emanian geometry, but here, the, you know, some curves are. I mean, I would claim that there's no role for space like curves in physics at all, but anyway, that's a separate point. But, <laughs> but that it just mathematically, you know, what. Some curves are, you know, are more equal than, <laughs> than other curves, and you, yeah, there's just no, nothing like that. For, for the yeah, I agree with so you. The yeah, yeah, the, the, indeed, the construction essentially relies on the Lorentzian signature. That's right. I agree with you. Again, I think we wouldn't be able to do what you can do with a single time direction. And I'm just curious whether you thought about it in the context of this Hawking thing, McCarthy management. Excellent. Uh, that know, is an excellent question. Which is uh, where again you can use proper time, and you can use proper times in volumes, space time volumes, or Alexander intervals. Yep. You can pretty much say everything you want to say about space time. Yeah, so uh, I should mention that Singh also has a construction for angles and also for areas and, and volumes as well that I didn't talk about for, for time reasons, but it kind of goes in the way that you expect it's going to go anyway, so this just illustrates the idea. Regarding um, um, like plus plus minus minus signatures, I thought about this a little bit and then I could never figure out how to interpret theories. Uh, that have this metric signature. Uh, that doesn't mean they're uninterpretable. I, I think this is just a fault of my own that I just cannot get my head around what they're representing. Uh, but if any of you have more experience with this sort of theory, um, I'd be interested in hearing how you interpret them. Lorentzian uh, nature that is, 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 uh, comes out of these constructions. And uh, I would like to swing back from that to the initial question with which you started out. Yeah. Whether this is indeed a situation in which space is not fundamental. Um, 
So I think what's fundamental is that there is a four-dimensional structure with a certain character, with a certain nature, with the, of the Lorentzian geometry. That's what's fundamental. Yeah. And of course, in some sense, purely spatial aspects of that are going to be derivative in that sense. But they're not going to be emergent in the sense in which uh, space or space-time may be emergent in quantum gravity. But they require yeah. somehow the really, you know, sort of uh, auspicious coming together of uh, many degrees of freedom in a particular way, uh, such that it does not necessarily emerge, but only under those, you know, certain circumstances and so on and so forth. I, I, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I think maybe I can, I can say this. Um, there is such a variety of different proposals for how that's going to work within different research programs. And from the side of uh, skeptical philosophers, there's been many questions about how the very idea that these sorts of things can be emergent is incoherent. Um, I think that looking at these sorts of examples shows how, yeah, you can get like a type of a physical magnitude that's totally different in character from another physical magnitude. You can get lengths from durations if you have the right structure. So if there happen to be objections that people gave that are skeptical about that type of move, it's possible that an analog to this might be applicable. Uh, in fact, my own opinion, but I think, well, maybe uh, Faye and Smitsu can clarify uh, what they think about the matter, that there's an analogous thing that happens in causal set theory. There's well-defined durations of processes. Well, to what extent do you get lengths? Well, there's this construction. Um, there is this limiting process that you often would want to have, uh, or you might want to have, that might be uh, characterized as emergence. But then someone could object, ah, you've got this formal uh, limit of structures that give you this other structure, but where do the spatial concepts come from? right? And now you've got an answer. But maybe you have a different point of view, so I don't want to impose that upon you. You mean what did Singh have in mind? When you say that our clock technology is so much better than the law technology. Yeah. Okay. That uh, you think about the precision, the, the what is it, the delta T or the T, which is what set of minus fourteen in our sense of clock T T by the law? Something like that. Or are you saying that delta T can be very small? Um Yeah, so this particular, uh, in this particular passage, which where I'm expositing Singh, it's in this popular science uh, article, and he doesn't make it precise okay. what exactly he means. He, he's really just trying to convince a reader who doesn't know anything about metrology that this is nonetheless a, a, good, a good idea. One thing that I have not done is look more extensively at all the documents around this time that Seng wrote. There might be more precise things that he said in other documents or in 
his archive uh, that might give more precise information about what exactly he meant when he's thinking about this um, practical priority of, of time over space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even carpenters agree with Singh, shouldn't we? <laughs> but isn't that very contingent on, on our being... For, for instance, I mean, think about weights, electromagnetic weights, right? And, and then there are the nodes, right? And where the electric field is zero. And there might be beings who are sort of sensitive to that, so they might find a sort of distance on this basis because there's this wave propagating there. And then maybe on this basis of uh, spatial distance, they introduce time. Yeah, I mean, so, and then it's metaphysically, I mean, not, not, not spatial. It's for us, it's very practical and so on. But I mean, from the metaphysics, they are on par, as, as you just described. I mean, sorry, but, but I'm pretty restricted by the fact that we, we live within a light complex. So, I mean, any, any measurement has to be causal. Anything that's physically done, whether we can see zero magnetic fields or or not, anything has to live within the light cone. So everything that we do is fundamentally within that light cone. So anything that, so the reconstruction of space that we do, because we are actually forced into the sitting thought in school by saying that, oh, this is you know some spatial distance. And I, I, but, but really all our experience is causal. Every single thing is causal. So we reconstruct in our minds what is the spatial distance. I don't think it has anything to do with our sensitivity to electromagnetism or not. It's just simply that we live inside the light cone. So it's a problem that the photon is on the light cone and we are only... Yeah, I mean, within or on the light cone. I mean, there are two worlds, massless particles. Being existent. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. but if, I, uh, if I may try to push back a bit on this question, um, I, I, I'm skeptical of any argument about <laughs> um, of this site because one can go forever and uh, I could say look you're not on a light line I mean you, everything you do is you, you need your head and it's just different in pattern and, and so uh, so you need some some body for, for the storing of which so that kind of fundamentality is always based upon some argument So it's hard, I, I mean, what you were objecting to me, I mean, one shouldn't uh, mix up what is easy for us to do, or what's unnatural for us to do, or what we do within a sort of nation uh, with what we want to think of fundamentally, whatever meaning we want to give. Yeah, but if you need physical process, any physical process has to have to within the light cone. So any physical conception or spatial Yeah, so actually, now's the time for a coffee break, so maybe you want to continue. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone.